All righty. Well, good morning, good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good, 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 good. Well, my name is Cam, and I'm one of the pastors around here. If, if we have not met, I want to welcome uh, any of our guests. Welcome to our church family. We're glad that you have joined us this morning, and we're excited to worship with you today. And hey, for those of you tuning in online, thanks for joining us wherever you may be. And um, I actually just got a text this morning from somebody uh, that's been joining us regularly from Montana. So hello to Montana. That's exciting. And um, hey, I do have a joke for us before we jump into God's word. Is that okay with everybody? <laughs> That's all I need right there. Yeah, just um, this one is actually really fun. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Two little boys ages eight and 10 are excessively mischievous. They are always getting into trouble and their parents know all about it. If any mischief occurs in, the, in their town, the two boys are probably involved. The boy's mother heard that a pastor in town had been successful in disciplining children. So she asked if he would speak with her boys. The pastor agreed, but he asked to see them individually. So the mother sent the eight-year-old first in the morning with the older boy to see the pastor in the afternoon. The pastor, a huge man with a booming voice, sat the younger boy down and asked him, do you know where God is, son? The boy's mouth dropped open, but he made no response, sitting there wide-eyed with his mouth hanging open. So the pastor repeated the question in an even sterner tone, where is God? Again, the boy made no attempt to answer. The preacher raised his voice even more, shook his finger in the boy's face and bellowed, where is God? The boy screamed and bolted from the room, ran directly home and dove into his closet, slamming the door behind him. When his older brother found him in the closet, he asked, what happened? The younger brother gasping for breath replied, we are in big trouble this time, dude. God is missing and they think we did it. <laughs> Isn't that fun? That's fun, right? That's a true story about my uh, older brother and myself. So, um, no. Hey, we have been in a sermon series this summer called Fruity. Everybody turn to your neighbor and say, Fruity. And we've been looking at the fruits of the Spirit that are found in the letter to the Galatians in chapter 5 of that book. And if you've missed any of our sermons, I'd encourage you to head onto our YouTube channel and you could check out any of those uh, amazing sermons that took place. Pastor Janelle did a great job uh, last week in unpacking patience. Has everybody been more patient this week? <laughs> You're like, okay, enough. <laughs> But hey, we've been looking at each of the fruits of the Spirit as an invitation from the Lord to allow the Holy Spirit to cultivate these fruits of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control in our lives. It's a way that we can walk in step with the Spirit and allow the Lord to help us uh, eradicate the desires of our flesh by living in the fruits of the Spirit instead. And so this week, we're going to be looking at the fruit of the Spirit that is called kindness. Everybody say, kindness. So in order to help us view this fruit of the Spirit, we're going to open our Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, why don't we turn open to Galatians chapter 5. And if you're able, as we do each week, we're going to stand to our feet as we read God's Word. We stand to our feet as we read God's Word because we want to honor God, we want to honor His Word, and we recognize that His Word calls us to action. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going to start in verse 16 and read through verse 25. This is what the word of the Lord says. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, rooting for the Dodgers, and the like. I will, I'm just, is that not in your Bible? Okay, sorry. Um. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep step with the Spirit. 
Let us pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word and we thank you, Lord, for the fruits of the spirit that you have given to each one of us who have called on your name as Lord and Savior. And this morning, God, we yield ourselves to you. We recognize your presence in this room. And Lord, this morning, we come to you acknowledging that we don't need more information. We need transformation in our midst, God. We don't need another sermon. We need a demonstration of your power this morning. And so, God, I bring myself before you and I I give these words before you, and I ask that you would transform them into healing and salvation words, Lord, that it would reach into our hearts and take deep root into the soil of who we are and bear a harvest of 30 and 60, even 100 times fold of your gospel message, Lord. Would you move in your kindness and your mercy and your goodness and your grace this morning? Would we leave different than when we came into this place by your presence, by your power, Lord? So your kingdom come, God. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Why don't you take a seat, and as you do, tell your neighbor, be kind and rewind. That's for all you Blockbuster fans out there. That's when you were a kid, well, when I was a kid, and I put my thumb on the rewind button, and then you'd have the indents of the two arrows, you know, any of that? anybody remember those days? Yeah. There's still one Blockbuster, by the way, in Bend, Oregon. It is fully functioning. Uh, Lord knows why. Um, <laughs> Netflix has been around for a long time, y'all. So, um, hey, uh, joking aside, I, I got a question. How many of you have ever heard, uh, by a show of hands, the phrase, kill them with kindness? Anybody ever heard that phrase before? Yeah? Um, anybody used that phrase before? Yeah? That phrase uh, originated with this implication to respond to aggression or animosity with kindness. It's saying that kindness can diffuse tension in relationships. It can uh, diffuse the hatred or discord or evil or difficulty in certain situations. And hear me out on this, um, and you need to hear me out on this. It doesn't mean we actually murder anybody. Amen? (laughs) I didn't hear enough amens to that, y'all. I'm kind of (laughs) concerned. It doesn't mean we kill anybody. It means that we respond to negativity and painful behavioral patterns with kindness to others, to ourselves, to the world around us. Has anybody seen the movie Moana in the room? My son is a big fan of this movie, so much so actually um, his, his uncle and aunt were out this morning and they were all watching Moana together. And I've probably watched Moana uh, 12 times in the last week and... Uh, <laughs> I know all the words to the songs, that's a whole other sermon, Uh, but the movie, if you haven't seen this movie, it's been out for a while, so it's your fault if I'm spoiling it. Um, (laughs) Moana follows the character Moana, who's holding the paddle, and she's going with Maui, the the guy behind her, to restore the heart of Tafiti, and Tafiti's this island and this goddess in the movie, Um, but when they go, they've got to go across the ocean and face many perils and dangers, and uh, in this, they have to face this guardian named Taka. And there's uh, Maui, the character here, who appears as a villain when Moana first meets him. And Taka appears as a villain when Moana first meets uh, Taka. But what Moana does in this film is the unexpected thing. She doesn't attack as expected. She doesn't do the expected means um, in the film, but she approaches them with kindness. She approaches them with kindness. Moana opens her ears and her heart to Maui and listens to what happened to him when he was a young boy that actually uh, led into his misguided and arrogant actions, right? And she found out that Taka is actually Tafiti and restores the heart to Tafiti and it restores the island and the world around her. And in both these instances, I bring this up because the posture and action and model of kindness is what leads to breakthrough. Are y'all with me today? It's not through the expected actions, but it's through the kindness of listening and pursuing restoration and exhibiting compassion and goodness and love to the people around that that won't even do the same for her. It's the ability to kill with kindness, which really means we're going to confront the brokenness of others and ourselves and this world with the immense love and grace and mercy of God. Amen? 
In many ways, this is the kindness that Paul is talking about as the fifth fruit of the Spirit. And if you remember, Paul is writing to the Galatian Christians and he's counseling them by the gospel truth to stop performing for salvation and to stop living from the desires of their flesh. And the way that he's leading them forward to do this is to keep in step with the Spirit, to live in the Spirit, to walk by the Spirit. And in doing so, they wouldn't live by the desires of their flesh. They wouldn't live according to legalism or performance, but instead they'd live according to the love and joy and peace and patience and kindness of God. And as we look to the scriptures, this kindness is most often attributed to God as his gracious and loving interaction with humanity. In Ephesians, Paul writes it this way, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. That's the good news, amen? The author of Titus writes it this way about the kindness of God. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, who he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been just justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Amen? Amen. This kindness is included in the fruits of the Spirit, and it's one that's deeply connected to God's gracious and loving and merciful and good action toward us. This is the kindness that when Moses asks God who he is in Exodus 34, the Lord tells him, I am the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in kindness. The Psalms are filled with shouts of praise to the God who is loving kindness itself and mercy in overabundance. God's kindness is seen all throughout the scriptures and compared to the other idols, the other gods that other nations worship, God was revealed as opposite. Where they were stern, where they were wrathful, where they were vengeful, God was patient. God was generous, God was compassionate, God was good, and we see this most fully revealed in Christ Jesus, amen? We see the kindness of God displayed through the gift of his son, and in all of these descriptions of who God is and what God gives in his kindness, we see that the fruit of the Spirit is best seen in our lives as we receive that and then display that in in grace that's expressed in our relationships with one another. It reveals that the opposites of the desires of our flesh and the actions of our flesh actually are the fruits of the Spirit, and it's actually kindness. We read it this morning. Paul mentions hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy. Do you know what the antidote to all those things is? Kindness. This is what God is giving us, not only as a gift of mercy and grace for us, but as a gift that we get to give to others, and I'm going to go there, ourselves too ourselves as well. We're called to receive and give these gifts and extend these things as a way to confront the desires of our flesh and the brokenness of our world with the kindness of God. Because I'll I'll let you in on a secret this morning. Are you all ready? There is nothing else that will break through the brokenness of our world but the kindness of God. There's nothing else that will break through the brokenness of our world but the kindness of our God. As we participate in kindness, what we're doing is actively putting to death the desires of our flesh. Those desires that say, I need to hate or divide or become jealous or become rageful or whatever it is, we are killing the desires of our flesh by putting on the spirit of God and living in the fruit of kindness. Amen? We're making space for that kindness to cultivate God's character in us, to overflow out of us, to look at those desires of our flesh and allow God's kindness to meet them and replace them with the fullness of the presence of God. And as we do that, our interactions with others and ourselves and this world will be filled with the only thing that can change it, which is God's kindness. Amen. So if you're following along in the sermon notes, if you're following along online, I want to give you our main idea this morning, and it's this. Kill them with kindness. Kill them with kindness. 
And again, I'm not referring to murdering anybody. I'm referring to putting to death the desires of our flesh, right? This is taking those places within us and bearing them before the Lord and saying, God, I want to give you the desires of my flesh that you would fill me with the desire of your spirit, which is that all of us would be carriers of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, that we would be those who reveal a witness of Christ's likeness to the world around us by bearing the kindness of God, by being those who say, here's the grace and mercy of God for me, for you, for all of creation, because love will, is the only answer that will conquer all, beloved. His loving kindness, amen? So this morning, I want to give you three p- ways in which you can receive God's kindness and allow it to kill the desires of the flesh and live out that kindness in relationships with others and God and yourself. And I believe as we are, are going to dig into the scriptures this morning, I believe God's going to meet us. Do you believe that too? I believe that God is going to open space in this time for you to encounter his kindness in ways that you have not encountered yet. And that he's going to fill you with that kindness and send you out with that kindness to be a carrier of his good news in the relationships and spaces of work and spheres of influence in your life and the lives around you. Is anybody ready for that today? Amen. Well, the first way that we can kill him with kindness and live in that kindness is our first point. It's this. Let God's kindness lead to repentance. Let God's kindness lead to repentance. The first step in putting to death the desires of our flesh and allowing God's kindness to take their place is allowing God's kindness to lead to repentance. So in the letter to the Romans, Paul is writing to Roman Christians and he's explaining the gospel to them. And he starts by telling them that God had made all of humanity and all of humanity exchanged the goodness and kindness of God for lies. And in this, they fell into sin. And he gives off a list of all of these sins and he shows them that they rejected God's goodness. And in this, they continue to reject God's goodness and forget about God's kindness when they pass judgment on one another. If there's anything that the church could hear today about passing judgment on others for sin and behaviors, it's this. When we pass judgment, we forget God's kindness. I'm gonna say it again. When we pass judgment on one another, we are forgetting God's kindness to us and to the person in front of us. And that is the context of what Paul writes in Romans 2, 4. He says this, or do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? This is the same message for our church today. We are called to daily remind ourselves that God's kindness is what leads us to repentance. His kindness is his grace and his mercy and his love that are lifelines to us of an eternal hope, amen? It's this grace and mercy of God in which we discover that we can turn from our old life into the newness and freshness of what Christ offers to every single person. You see, what Jesus gives us is God's mercy, which is not, it's it's God not giving us what we deserve. That's Jesus taking our penalty of death in sin. And then grace is us being given what we don't deserve. That's Jesus paying us life when we deserve death, beloved. God's gifts of grace and mercy meet us all throughout our lives and they empower us and fill us with his goodness and provision and healing and love as we claim him as our Lord and our Savior. Amen? William Barclay said it this way, the word grace emphasizes at one and the same time the helpless poverty of humanity and the limitless kindness of God. Isn't it be grateful that God is limitlessly kind? This limitless kindness is what leads us to repentance. Repentance is this scriptural idea of turning the opposite direction. It's a scriptural idea of asking for forgiveness. It's a scriptural idea of changing the way that we think and that we live. When Jesus launched his public ministry, that was the first word he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. And all throughout the New Testament, the the authors of the letters decided to use this idea of repentance as a central theme and a call for the people of God. Change the way that you think so that you could change the way that you live. Amen? 
And it's this transformation of our lives that gives us a new way to think and to see and to speak and to live. It's the response to Paul's encouragement to the early Christians to, to say this, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's kindness, in view of God's goodness, put on this lens and allow this to be the way in which you view others and yourselves and the things of this world and the things of the kingdom of God. God's kindness reminds us that we are undeniably and always in need of God's grace. Does anybody in this room think they're not in need of God's grace right now? Because you're wrong. (laughs) It also reminds us of this. We did not save ourselves. We are not perfect. We cannot pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We are not called to pass judgment on others. We are called to view ourselves and others through the limitless mercy and goodness and kindness that God has extended to every single person. It's this kindness that gives us thoughts that align with God's thoughts and actions that align with heaven on earth and words that form in, in, in formation with the word of God. It's this kindness that reminds us that goodness and grace follow us all the days of our lives, beloved. And that we can welcome others into that place too. This kindness leads us to repentance and it helps us remember who God is, who we are, what we are called to do. And do you know why this is so important? Because we forget too much too often. We forget too much too often. And when we forget about God's kindness, we forget to repent. And when we forget to repent and we forget about God's kindness, it leads to opposite actions of the fruit and the desires of the Spirit. Do you want to know where judgment comes from? It comes from us forgetting God's kindness towards us. Do you want to know where hatred comes from? It comes from forgetting God was kind to us when we least deserved it. Do you want to know where discord and dissensions and envy and rage and all of these things come from? It comes from us forgetting about God's kindness and goodness and grace, meeting us at the lowest places of our lives and bringing us out of a pit and setting our feet upon a rock and putting a new song in our mouth, beloved. Rather than treating others from the the mercy that we've been treated with, when we forget, we will just cast shame and judgment, but God has already overcome that, invites us out of that, amen? And listen, I'm not saying we should overlook the weight of sin or the brokenness of harmful actions or what people have done to us or what we've done to other people. I am saying this though, we are called to allow the foundation of God's kindness to lead us to repentance daily. Daily, it's a consistent reminder of God's grace to us and God's grace to all people. Ed Silvoso says it this way, repentance is elicited by goodness. It's not God's wrath or anger, but his promise of grace to grant forgiveness that announces to the world, come, no sin could ever trump my grace. Sinners flock to Jesus, attracted by the grace he openly projected. His whole demeanor was engraved with, you are welcome, written in letters of grace. Once sinners came to him, he taught them the the divine truth, exacting and costly, but always palatable because of the context of grace in which it was presented. So can I give you a practical action step to to allow God's grace to lead you to repentance? Everybody still with me? Our, Our practical action step is this. Regularly repent. Regularly repent. In Luke 18, Jesus tells a parable about uh, uh, two people who came into the temple to pray. One of them was a Pharisee, a religious leader of the day, and another was a tax collector who was often seen as one of the worst sinners of the day. And the Pharisee stands up to pray and says, God, thank you that I'm not like any of these other wretched, awful sinners. And then he's like, especially that guy over there, that tax collector, And speaking of which, look at all of the good things I have done. Look at how generous I am. I am blessed. And then it gets to the tax collector who comes forward and he gets into this posture. And he beats his breast and says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And it was this posture, it was this prayer that the Lord said, that is justification. That is exaltation. That is the posture of somebody who is truly repentant. 
Beloved, in this way, regular repentance is our call to remind ourselves of God's goodness and mercy and grace, to keep our minds and our actions and our lives and our words deeply anchored in humility rather than arrogance. We have not arrived, beloved. We are just as desperately in need of God's grace today as we were the first day that we came to him. We are desperately in need of his love to cover those places within us. And I'd encourage you each day, set a reminder on your phone, give some space in your morning, in your afternoon, in your evening time to simply pray this prayer. Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. This isn't gonna earn you salvation. It's not gonna uh, get you new forgiveness. And I need to make this point really clear. You don't need new forgiveness, beloved. When, you were on, when, you, when Jesus was on the cross, all of your sin was in the future. Your debt has been paid in full, beloved. When you say yes to the blood of Jesus covering you, you're fully covered, amen? What this is, is an acknowledgement of it. It's a recognition that God's mercy and kindness and grace are holding up every moment of your existence. In him, we live and move and have our being, amen? This is a reminder that says, God, you've met me in this place and you're leading me and guiding me as I daily present my heart and mind before you to do what only you could do in your kindness in me and through me, amen? Amen. So I wanna encourage you, let God's kindness lead to repentance as we regularly repent. The second point this morning is let God's kindness lead to renewal. Let God's kindness lead to renewal. God's kindness is what leads to renewal in our lives and to those around us. Paul makes it abundantly clear that the desires and actions of the flesh lead to division and decay and even death itself. But the fruits of the Spirit, specifically God's kindness, are what are a part of life in the Spirit and life eternal, and they will unify and build up and multiply life, right? If you remember, we read this earlier. Paul said this in Titus. When the kindness and love of God, of our, uh, God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. It's the kindness and love of God that's revealed through Jesus and it offers us salvation, amen? Y'all still with me? I know I made a baby cry, but everybody's good, right? (laughs) This salvation isn't based on our work. His saving work is done through the rebirth and renewal that comes from the Holy Spirit, amen? This is the reality of our lives every day. This idea of renewal is one that's actually really uh, similar to something being unusable or dead, and through transformation, it's made usable and alive, This is an idea that's really closely associated to reclamation, which is defined as the conversion of a wasteland into land that's suitable for habitation or cultivation. I'm going to say that again because this is spiritually profound. Reclamation is the conversion of wasteland into land that is suitable for use of habitation or cultivation. The work of God, the process in which God acts in our lives, takes the dead places in us and makes them habitable for life. It takes the wasteland and makes it a paradise in a garden, beloved. It takes where we were dead and brings it to life because of his great mercy. We are now the habitation of the Holy Spirit. His fruits of the Spirit can be cultivated in us. This is the work of God in Christ Jesus, and it's the opposite of what we deserve. It's the opposite of what we deserve. This is good news for us, beloved. And this is, not, this is extended not only to us, but to be extended through us as the opposite of what's expected against other people. That means this, when people get angry, we meet them with encouragement. When people meet us by tearing us down, we meet them back by building them up. When people meet us with avoidance or pushing away or escaping, we meet them with welcoming them in with compassion. Paul writes it this way in Colossians, therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Because we've been forgiven, we should forgive, amen? Because we've had compassion given to us, we should give compassion to others freely. 
Because kindness has been extended to us, we should extend kindness to other people. This looks like us acting in the opposite of what is expected. Maybe of how others are treating us, maybe of how we have treated others, maybe of how we think we ought to be treated. This is the process of allowing God to renew and rebuild something in us as we receive and extend his kindness to the people around us. It's allowing God's kindness to take deep root in us and to become our truth and our response in the midst of the things that are happening and will happen in and around us. Amen? Blaise Pascal, the French spiritual writer, wrote it this way, cold words freeze people. Hot words scorch them, bitter words make them bitter, wrathful words make them wrathful, kind words do not cost much. They never blister the tongue or lips, they make other people good natured. They also produce their image on other souls and a beautiful image it is. They smooth and quiet and comfort the hearer. Beloved, the simple reality is that God's kindness helps us to live in and from renewal in our lives and the lives around us. It's a way in which we can recognize that God has kindly taken us from our wasteland of pain and destruction and division and death, and he's led us into a promised land of hope and unity and life forevermore. And because of this, as we recognize we can offer this to all people as well, we understand, right, that hurt people hurt people, right? We understand this, but kind people lead others to this place of renewal. When the baseline of others' actions are pain against us, the baseline of our actions is kindness for them. It's empathy for them. It's compassion for them. Kindness and renewal help us to respond from truth and allow that truth not only to set us free, but all people free. Amen? So I want to give you a practical action step this morning to let God's kindness lead to renewal, and it's this. Act from truth. Act from the truth. More often than not, when others hurt us, or when we believe in accusation, or when we're in a cycle of maybe self-judgment or self-criticism, guess what the root of that is? It's a lie. It's a lie. We tend to act from lies. We believe accusations. We allow one action to define who we think we are or who we think that person is or who we think that group is. The truth, though, is what God offers to us in his kindness. And the truth is able to remind us that there is another reality, a better reality, a greater reality, a reality where there is freedom and hope and goodness and kindness for us to anchor ourselves in and live in. Amen? Because the truth is this. God is making all things good. God loves us. God is for us. God sees other people. God sees us. God knows us. God knows all things. God holds all things together. And he calls us to receive and participate in his kindness and his truth so that we can respond from that place, not from our desires, not from our flesh, but from his truth and his kindness, beloved. And as we do this, we are sowing things now that we will see forever, As we respond in kindness and truth, these are not things that come from our flesh, they come from the Spirit. Which means when we sow them now, we will reap them forever. N.T. Wright writes it this way, every act of love, gratitude, and kindness, every work of art or music inspired by the love of God and delight in the beauty of his creation, every minute spent teaching a severely handicapped child to read or to walk, every act of care and nature of comfort and support for one's fellow human beings or for that matter, one's fellow non-human creatures, and of course, every prayer, all spirit-led teaching, every deed that spreads the gospel, builds up the church, embraces and embodies holiness rather than corruption, and makes the name of Jesus honored in the world, all of this will find its way through the resurrecting power of God into the new creation that God will one day make. That is the logic of the mission of God. God's recreation of his wonderful world, which began with the resurrection of Jesus and continues mysteriously as God's people live in the risen Christ and in the power of his spirit means that what we do in Christ and by the spirit in the present is not wasted. It will last all the way into God's new world. Beloved, when we receive the truth from God in his kindness and respond and act from that place of truth, we are partnering with his everlasting kingdom in bringing heaven on earth. We respond to rage and division and envy and dissension, not with the same thing, but with generosity, with compassion, with kindness, with unity, with love. We do as Micah prophesied. We act justly. We love mercy. We walk humbly with our God. Amen. 
And in this, there is an encounter with God's truth that truly does still set free. Amen? Can I give you one more point this morning? The last way we can kill him with kindness is we ought to let God's kindness lead us to readiness. So we allow God's kindness to lead us to repentance. We allow God's kindness to lead us to renewal. And the third one is we let God's kindness lead us to readiness. Now, Kindness deals with an excellence when it's talking about things that, uh, things, but it deals with a graciousness when it deals with relationships. And we know this to be true because kindness is revealed to us through Jesus, amen? And we know this to be true about things because his work is perfect and it is finished, amen? And we know this to be gracious because of the offer that's been extended to us and the continuing redemption by the Holy Spirit in our lives, this renewal work that's happening in us by the power of God, amen? But in all of this, there is a truth that is radically evident. Are you ready for this truth? Jesus is always ready to be kind. I'm gonna say that again. Jesus is always ready to be kind, In the gospel, according to Mark, Jesus encounters in the first chapter a man who has leprosy all over his skin. And he asks Jesus, if you are willing, will you heal me? And Jesus says, I am willing. And he heals that leper. And he continues to reveal his kindness in healing and his willingness for for his kindness to be extended to all people, not just in that moment, but in multiple other moments where he's met with what Mark uses as immediately. Immediately after getting off a boat where they were crashed by wind and waves in the middle of the sea, he's met by a man demonized and he casts out those demons immediately. Immediately he turns and gets on a boat again and gets off and he's met by a synagogue leader who says, you need to come and heal my daughter. Immediately another woman encounters him and reaches out to the hem of his garment. Immediately, immediately he's met by religious leaders. Immediately he's met by his disciples. Immediately, immediately, immediately. And guess what? Along all of this route, Jesus is always ready to extend kindness. He never responds out of a place of of the desire of his flesh. He always responds out of a readiness to do good and be compassionate and extend healing to the people around him. And yes, this is the type of kindness that God is calling us through his word to clothe ourselves with each day. Paul in Ephesians 6 is encouraging the early church to clothe themselves with the full armor of God. He includes the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit. And you got to ask yourself, what's missing? And yes, you're right, pants. Pants are missing. (laughs) Where are the pants? And... No, but really what's missing is verse 15. With your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. This is the reality, beloved. The readiness is connected to the good news of Jesus and it's an extension of his loving kindness to us and through us. It's a readiness that empowers us to see Jesus was always ready to do good and be compassionate. And that's what we're called to clothe ourselves with. In fact, this kindness of the fruit of the Spirit is continued later on in Galatians when Paul writes this in chapter 6. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. This is our call, friends, to be Those who do good and are always ready to do good, especially to those who are in this family. Amen? But let me just say, it's easy to love those who are easy to love. But Jesus had some really challenging words in Luke 6. He said this, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. What? Wait, what? (laughs) Bless those who curse you. What? Pray for those who mistreat you. Really? If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. Okay, I don't know about this. If someone takes your cloak, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to anyone who asks. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. 
Listen to this. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked." Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Those are hard words, but they're true words. And they're breakthrough words. And they're empowerment words. Because our world tells us to, it's, that we live in a dog-eat-dog society. I'll do to you as you do to, do to me as long as I get ahead. But what the word of God calls us to do is not only to be nice and kind and loving and generous and compassionate to those who give it to us, but to do it to those who don't want to do it to us, who have not given it to us, who mistreat us and speak poorly about us. Because here's the reality, beloved, when we give to those who can give back to us, it doesn't take any faith or trust or kindness to do that. But when we give to those who can't give back to us, this is what true kindness looks like. This is what true kindness looks like because our calling is not to get anything back, beloved. Our calling is simply to recognize that the kindness of God is always ready to do good and be compassionate. And in this partnering with God's kindness, there will be breakthrough, amen? Because this is the only thing that can break through the walls and structures and systems and brokenness of darkness and evil in our world. It's the only thing that will provide a lasting encounter with the presence of God is the extension of his kindness in and through our lives. J.R.R. Tolkien writes it this way, some believe it is only great power that can hold evil at check, but that is not what I have found. I have found that it is the small everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay. Small acts of kindness and love. Isn't that the truth? So I want to give you one practical last action step this morning, and it's this. Posture yourself to serve. If you want to let God's kindness lead you to readiness, posture yourself to serve. I think for many people, we miss the opportunity to extend kindness to others because we're entering into spaces in a posture in which we want to be served, or we want to be heard, or we want to be approached, or I'll be honest, a lot of us don't want to be approached. (laughs) or any number of other postures out there. But what if we entered into situations or workspaces or relationships or family gatherings or whatever it is and we just ask the Lord and others and ourselves, how can I be of service today? What can I do to promote and give kindness to the people around me? Because here's the biggest thing, beloved. The greatest act of kindness has already been displayed and his name is Jesus. And it was the gift of his death and resurrection for all people. You don't need to lay yourself on the cross as a display of kindness to anybody. Jesus already did that for them. Your call is simple acts of kindness for the people around you. I was recently in Washington for a wedding and I was at a coffee shop doing some work and meeting with some people and um, I had to get up in, in the middle of uh, this time and uh, one of the baristas I, was somebody I used to pastor while I was there and I felt the Lord just give this small encouragement. And so I shared this word with her and I could see tears forming in her eyes and, and she said, I just, this is just speaking to me so much. Can I have a hug? And I gave her a hug and she said, thank you so much for taking the time just to share that brief encouragement and just seeing like the smile and the hug that was connected with it. I have not felt the joy of the Lord like this in a long time and I just needed this simple moment of kindness. And I'm not saying this because I'm the golden standard of kindness. I am not. I'm saying this because you don't know how much it will take for your living expression of kindness to lift another person up. It's a simple smile, beloved. It's a simple gesture. It could be a word from the Lord. It could be a high five. It could be any number of things, but all we are called to do is be in this place where we are acknowledging God has called us to be kind and we can meet others with our expression of kindness and have God's kindness meet them in that space too, amen? Mother Teresa said it this way, be the living expression of God's kindness, kindness in your face, in your eyes, and in your smile. I'm gonna welcome up our worship team at this point. Beloved, we are called to receive God's kindness and allow that kindness to put to death the desires of our flesh. 
This happens through repentance. This happens through renewal. This happens through readiness that equips us to always be ready to do good and be compassionate and serve others with the kindness of God. Amen? I'm going to ask for you to stand to your feet this morning. I'm going to welcome up our, our altar prayer team as well. As we conclude our time this morning, we want to give some space for you to respond to God's word, to God's presence, to God's kindness this morning. And there might be some stirring that's happening in the hearts of the people of God in this room. There might be some things that the Lord is stirring in your heart, dealing with repentance, dealing with mindsets, dealing with a number of things that the Lord might be speaking to you about. And I want to say this, this altar is open. Our prayer team is ready and willing and able to lay hands and pray and seek the Lord on your behalf. There might be things that you're in need of entering in for God to renew and reclaim in your life. You might feel like there's some dead spaces in you and we believe in a God who makes dead things alive. Amen? We believe in a God who takes broken things and makes them whole and is still in the business of resurrection today, amen? And so as the worship team leads, you might have that inkling for repentance or renewal. You might have that inkling for, I I don't feel ready for kindness to be extended in in this place in my life or in this relationship. The Spirit of God is able to empower us with the kindness of God to meet every single circumstance and relationship in our lives, beloved. So as we respond this morning, as our worship team leads us in this place, I'd encourage you to come forward and receive, to do business with the Lord. Maybe it's in your chair. Maybe it's with a prayer team member. Maybe it's just up here at the altar. I want to encourage you this morning that the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is in this place and he's ready to meet you today. Amen. So God, we thank you for your kindness this morning. We thank you that you are gracious and merciful and good. We thank you that you are kind. And we come to you this morning and we say yes to all that you want to do in and through us in this space, God. We respond with open hearts. Fill us with your kindness. Give us an encounter with your kindness again today. Lord, we respond with hearts of worship, with hearts of adoration, and we invite you to do what only you can do in this space, Lord. In Jesus' name.